All right. Um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Bryn Davis. Bryn Davis is a researcher in the Department of Mathematics at the Imperial College London. He's an expert in wave propagation in complex media. And today he will talk about mathematical analysis of sub-wavelength metamaterials, sensors, biomimicry, and topological edge modes. Uh, I'll leave it to you, Bryn. Thank you, Alice. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the slight late running. Uh, before we start, thank you also to um, Sebastian, Bogdan, and Roma for the uh, ongoing organization of this uh, excellent initiative. Um, so as Alice alluded to in her introduction, uh, I'm going to talk about um, some of our work that's been an analysis of, of wave propagation in complex media. And in particular, I'm going to give a, a survey of some of our results from my time at ETH. Um, which is where I was based before I came to Imperial. And these results came from some work that was um, the, the group had been doing to perform first principles asymptotic analysis to characterize high contrast scattering problems. And the outcome of all this was that we arrived at a uh, sort of first principles rigorous method um, that turned out to be somewhat uh, versatile. Um, and so we've been able to use it to study several different metamaterial problems. And that's what I want to give you uh, a sense of today. So before I um, go into specifics, allow me to start by giving a little bit of context. Uh, so we're interested in, in studying materials composed of uh, many small repeating sub-wavelength resonant elements. In the setting of acoustics, um, the classical example of this sub-wavelength resonance uh, is that which was first observed by uh, Marcel Minert in the early 20th century. And it came about through his work on trying to understand the acoustic properties of air bubbles in water. And this, this property, that, that air bubbles are indeed highly contrasting material inclusions, this property that they exhibit which is that they, uh, they act as very strong scatterers of, of waves, um, even at very small and indeed sub-wavelength scales. Uh, this property is not only interesting, but it's also useful. Uh, and it means that we can use these as the building blocks for larger, more complex structures. For example, uh, this is the experimental setup from a team of the, um, at the University of Manitoba. Um, and they were able to reproduce this uh, scattering behavior using uh, gas bubbles injected into um, a polymer gel, um, the relatively high viscosity of which means the bubbles hold their shape and so they're able to start to design uh, complex structures with a variety of exotic properties and applications. Um, and it's with this in mind that we're able to, uh, to use this phenomenon of sub-wavelength resonance to design, uh, well, design metamaterials. And thus, we're going to study uh, fundamentally the following problem, which is that we have some disjoint union of material inclusions uh, whose material parameters are highly contrasting with those of the background medium, as was the case for air bubbles and water, for example. And our aim is to derive um, a first principles method for characterizing the structure. Um, but we want this method to be sufficiently uh, concise and, and easy to work with that we can use it to uh, efficiently and, and, and effectively study a range of interesting problems and applications. And so what follows uh, will look something like the following. So I'll start by uh, presenting our asymptotic method. Uh, this is going to use uh, boundary integral formulations and will characterize the sub-wavelength resonant modes of the system in terms of the eigenstates of a, of a matrix that I'll introduce. We'll then go on to look at some examples of it in action. Uh, the first concerns the design of bio-inspired metamaterials, which in this case are based on the cochlea. Uh, the second will be an analysis of non-Hermitian metamaterials, uh, which are designed to have um, exceptional points and have applications in, in enhanced sensors. And then finally, we'll look at periodic structures and design robust and topological waveguides. 
this talk is going to be uh, somewhat compartmentalized into, into four separate, separate parts. And so if I, if I lose it at some point, there are several opportunities to, to jump back on board. So we're interested in studying uh, scattering by a collection of disjoint material inclusions, uh, which I'm going to assume to have um, appropriate continuity on, their, on the boundary so that our operators are um, well behaved. And we want to characterize the resonance of this system in the case that the incident wavelength is much larger than the structure. Now, in particular, we're going to study a uh, Helmholtz formulation, like so. And this has uh, transmission boundary conditions uh, on the boundaries of the resonators. The thing to highlight here are these parameters delta uh, that appear in the continuity of flux on the boundaries. I've highlighted them because these will be crucial. These are going to turn out to be our asymptotic parameters. So in the acoustic case, this corresponds to the uh, ratio of the density inside and outside the resonators. So for example, in the case of you know, our favorite example of air bubbles and water, uh, these would have the value on the order of 10 to the minus three. And we're trying to understand the resonance states of this, uh, this problem. Uh, there are a range of methods we could use. So lots of the uh, classical methods tend to depend on um, the shape of the resonators. Uh, so, for example, if we're willing to assume either spherical or circular inclusions, uh, then if we use appropriate coordinate systems, then we can deal with this very nicely. If we want to handle uh, more generally shaped resonators, which we do, um, then integral formulations uh, are, are very popular. Now, we're going to use um, boundary integrals uh, in this work, but, but volume integrals are also uh, widespread. And in either of these cases, the key realization is that um, these integral formulations yield a non-linear eigenvalue problem, uh, the analysis of which falls into this nice, uh, quite general theory, which is for characterizing scattering resonances as the poles of uh, certain operators, and these operators turn out to be meromorphic. Another thing to highlight is that, uh, in particular in this work, we want to characterize the sub-wavelength behavior of our system. Again, there are classical approaches here. For example, uh, a standard thing would be, would be to perform asymptotics in terms of either the limit of low frequency or of small particle size. And by extension, uh, homogenization techniques are also commonly applied. In this work, however, we're going to take a, a slightly different approach uh, and instead consider an asymptotic limit in terms of these material contrast parameters delta. And so I introduced this, in particular, this controlling real value parameter uh, delta, and this will be our asymptotic parameter. And with this in mind, we can define the notion of sub wavelength resonance to be a resonant frequency omega which uh, firstly depends on this delta continuously, um, but additionally and crucially uh, converges to zero as a function of delta converging to zero. And the advantage of this approach uh, is that the, the limiting problem, so the, the problem when delta is zero, uh, is non-trivial. And I mean that in the sense that it has non-trivial resonance solutions. Um, and then we can study the system for small, non-zero delta as a perturbation of this state. We can use asymptotic perturbation theory to, to study the, the, the perturbed eigenmodes. And what we'll see is that this approach uh, really can re reveals the mechanisms that make uh, this sub-wavelength resonance, defined in this asymptotic sense, fundamentally different from, uh, shall we say, typical wavelength type resonance. Um, it also allows us to understand the uh, near field behavior of a system of resonators that has fixed position and size. So what we'll see shortly is that the notion of capacitance will be central to our study of the resonant properties of this system. 
Uh, and this is a, a concept that's been lifted uh, directly from uh, electrostatics. Um, so for a system of three material inclusions uh, in three dimensions, we can define capacitance coefficients like so. Um, so this is a set of a set of integrals involving the Laplace single layer potential, uh, which is this Green's operator defined on the, the boundary of the, the resonators. And this gives a, a square matrix with dimension equal to the number of resonators in our system of, of finitely many resonators. As I say, in the setting of uh, electrostatics, these have been studied uh, quite extensively. Um, they were first introduced by Maxwell. Um, and they're used to relate the distributions of potential and charge in a system of conductors. In our, um, conversely, in our wave scattering setting, uh, the intuition is, is broadly similar. However, the quantity we're interested in, is, we're interested in is instead this generalized capacitance matrix, which are the same, so it's capacitance coefficients, but multiplied by this, uh, this prefactor, this weighting term. Um, and this weighting term includes information about, if you see in the, the denominator here, information about the sizes of the resonators. Um, and it also in the numerator includes information about the uh, material parameters on each resonator. And when we do this, the main results end up looking uh, like so. Um, so recalling this definition of subweightings resonance as this asymptotic condition of omega converging to zero as a function of delta going to zero. Then um, we have firstly this existence result, which says that if you have a system of n of these material inclusions, uh, then for sufficiently small asymptotic parameter, uh, there are going to exist n of these subwavelengths resonant frequencies. So n frequencies satisfying this asymptotic condition, uh, which have positive real part. And then given the existence of these n frequencies, we can then find an asymptotic, compute an asymptotic formula for these frequencies. Um, and it turns out that at leading order, they're just given by the square root of the eigenvalues of this generalized capacitance matrix. It's worth noting that since the, um, the delta i's appeared in this, this coefficient, we multiplied the capacitance coefficients by to get the generalized capacitance matrix. Uh, these eigenvalues scale like delta um, for small delta. Uh, so this, these frequencies do indeed converge to zero and have leading order, leading order behavior um, given by a square root of delta for small delta. If we feel so inclined, we can also keep going with these um, the computations that we did to arrive at, at, at that theorem. And we can, for example, compute higher order approximations of these frequencies. Um, here, I'm showing them just for the case of um, all the resonators having the same wave speeds and, and contrast parameters, uh, just to simplify the expression. And what we see is that the leader order is this eigenvalue of the generalized capacitance matrix. And then the subsequent order is uh, involves this term tau, which is some quantity involving, uh, crucially involving VNs, which are the eigenvectors of the generalized capacitance matrix. Uh, the detail is perhaps not so important, but what is worth highlighting is shown in this plot, which is a comparison of the, uh, of the in the complex plane. <laughs> The frequencies computed using the capacitance matrix approximation, and we're comparing them to the, the, the true values or the numerical values, which are the crosses, um, and you see reasonable agreement, but crucially you see reasonable agreement with a significant reduction in computational time. And this reduction comes from the fact that uh, even though we still need to use some a numerical method to compute the generalized capacitance matrix, which depending on your geometry may be more or less easy, um, particularly if your, your geometry has um, uh, some, some corners and things. Uh, in spite of that, the capacitance matrix approach this asymptotic approximation has removed the need to do any numerical refinding. Um, and thus, thus we save several orders of magnitude in computational time.
one final thing to highlight before we move on to looking at applications is that um, the analysis also tells us that uh, while the resonant frequency is given a leading order by the eigenvalue of this generalized capacitance matrix, the corresponding eigenvector is similarly given by, um, also the, the corresponding resonant mode is given by the corresponding eigenvector of the uh, generalized capacitance matrix. So the point is that this, uh, the eigenstates of this, uh, this matrix we've constructed uh, really do determine the uh, leading order, the resonant properties or the sub-wavelength resonant properties of this n-body system. Um, so this is, which I think is, is nice because this result is while on the one hand it's derived from first principles um, and it comes with um, explicit error terms. This result is also sufficiently intuitive and easy to work with and um, that we can, uh, we can readily use this theory to handle a variety of, um, of useful and important applications. The first of which that we're going to look at today uh, is or concerns the design of um, cochlear inspired metamaterials. So briefly for some context, the cochlea is this uh, small spiral shaped organ. It's located a, a few centimeters inside the head of a human. Um, and it's really at the, the center of our hearing. And I mean that in the sense that it's here that uh, sounds are filtered according to frequency. Um, so you see from the sketch that lower sounds give a maximal response at one end and higher sounds give a maximal response at the other. And then subsequently, once the sounds have been filtered, uh, they're converted into neural impulses, which are sent to the brain. And this is really a um, biological realization of the, the rainbow trapping phenomenon. Um, there's a, not only is this the size gradient as more or less depicted in this sketch, um, but also the, the membrane on which the receptor cells are, are mounted in the cochlea has graded stiffness. And this is the crucial mechanism that allows it, that allows it to filter different frequencies. And so with this in mind, um, out of this community of people working on graded metamaterials, there have emerged uh, several attempts to design biomimetic devices that mimic cochlear function. Um, so these, these devices have, have been somewhat wide ranging in nature, but are all based on some graded array of resonators. For example, there's these two arrays at the top that have a, a duct with um, graded Helmholtz resonators coming off them. In the middle here, I've picked up two slightly more abstract works, considering other mass spring models or arrays of vibrating reeds. And at the bottom here, we have a nice experimental work where they're using uh, quarter wavelength resonators uh, in a scaled up array. Um, and then the subtlety to highlight here is if you look closely, there are all these wires um, lying around the place. And that's because they've implemented uh, microphone speaker arrays at the ends of some of the resonators, uh, which allows them to add amplification routines. So this turns it into an active metamaterial um, and allows it to uh, even better replicate the function of the cochlea, uh, which it turns out is, is, is indeed an active sensor and uses an amplification mechanism in its function. So in our setting, using our generalized capacitance matrix approach, we can likewise study a graded array of resonators and seek to understand the extent to which it mimics the cochlea. Uh, so our array looks something like the following, which is considering a straightened out model in this work. And then we can, for example, um, in fact, crucially, we can set up the geometry in such a way that we get uh, this bio-inspired response. And so here we're plotting on the x-axis the position of maximum excitation and plotting that relative to uh, the incoming frequency and then comparing the red line here is the response that exists in the human cochlea. And the geometry has been designed um, in order, optimized in order to uh, match the response of the resonators, which is the crosses to this uh, biological relationship. 
when you do this, when you fit the geometry such that the uh, frequency separation matches the, the biological relationship, turns out you also get some other um, properties which replicate the cochlea. Um, one to highlight, which uh, is, is particularly relevant for people doing cochlear mechanics, is that the uh, evolution over time of the scattered field um, replicates the response to the cochlea in the sense that you have this amplitude peak, which moves from left to right, so from small to big through the array, uh, in doing so has um, decreasing wavelength up to this point of, of maximum response, and then it, and then it dies down. Uh, and this, for, for people that study graded metal materials, this behavior is, um, uh, is not, not surprising, and indeed is what it expected. Um, but the fact that it, when we fit the curve to on the left, we get the behavior on the right, and that this matches what cochlear mechanics people expect um, is uh, eye-catching at least. So with this in hand, one of the, um, the nice things about having our analytic framework is that at least in the setting of our abstract model, it's easy to play around with, um, with all sorts of things. And for example, uh, we can model the introduction of amplification to the system. Um, so as I mentioned, this, this further mimics the action of the cochlea, which is not just a passive sensing array, but has uh, active elements that contain motor proteins. However, the uh, details of this amplification mechanism are a very significant open question, uh, probably the biggest open question in auditory science. In our model, uh, we can um, quite happily play around with the, the different types of the nonlinearities, uh, which we're implementing uh, by adding this nonlinear forcing term. And so, for example, we can play around with this uh, Hopf type nonlinearity, uh, which is a, a popular model. And we can, for example, looking at the plots on the right, we can demonstrate the extent to which um, this, uh, this system is stable. So we have phase space diagrams, and you can, you can witness the convergence, the stable convergence to these equilibria. Then on the left, we have um, a plot of the amplification, amplification shown here as a function of frequency. And here we've shown it for three different uh, amplitudes, three different volumes of sound, and the quietest being at the, at the top and the loudest on the bottom. And from this, you see uh, one of the most um, important reasons why this, um, why this amplification is helpful to us humans. And that's because it, it amplifies quiet sounds much more greatly than louder ones. And this is the mechanism that allows us humans to efficiently hear sounds which range over such a wide range of volumes. So what we have here is a physical structure that is designed to filter sounds in a way that replicates how the human ear does it. Now, on the other hand, there's a very large uh, signal processing community trying to decide algorithms that do, I claim, more or less exactly the same thing in the sense that they're trying to replicate the function of the human auditory system. And thus our idea has been to given that we have this uh, analytic framework, to use these results to, um, as the starting point for trying to build bio-inspired signal processing algorithms. And so just, uh, just briefly, we have um, a result like so, that says that the scattered field, at least at leading order, uh, takes the form of um, a, a modal decomposition over the sub-wavelength resonant modes assuming the incoming field is um, suitably sub-wavelength. This decomposition has the form of spatial eigenmodes multiplied by some time-dependent coefficients, which are given by the convolution of the incoming wave with some kernel functions. And these kernel functions turn out to be uh, first-order gamma terms. So those are sinusoids windowed by some uh, gamma distribution. <clears throat> 
And the reason this is, or one reason this is nice, um, or one reason why we should be pleased with this is because several other studies, including both um, biophysical studies and also numerical studies, have pointed towards uh, approaches of this type, so convolutions with gamma tone kernels, um, as being uh, particularly effective at mimicking the human auditory system. Now, so this observation led us to thinking about this um, three-way exchange of ideas. And this is an example of biomimicry. So biomimicry being the practice of uh, taking advantage of nature's remarkable ability to devise innovative solutions to challenging problems uh, by taking design inspiration directly from those solutions, mimicking them. And so our asymptotic method facilitates a, a three-way of ex exchange of ideas and concepts. Uh, so not only between biological systems and, and, met and metamaterial devices, which is, was our starting point and our motivation for starting this project, um, but also allows us to, to encompass signal processing algorithms as well. And so with this in mind, let's kind of run with this for a few moments, just to give a sense of, of where this work is, is now heading. So we can also um, playing on, particularly playing on uh, this arrow, going from biology to computational algorithms. Uh, we can look to add additional processing steps that mimic other properties of human hearing. Um, so for example, um, humans have this ability to identify features of sounds not just locally in time, but also recognize long range global structures and, and statistical properties of sound. And we know this because humans uh, are observed to be particularly well adapted to hearing a class of sounds that are often known as natural sounds. This is maybe a slightly misleading name because they don't necessarily have to be natural. Um, for example, most music is included, um, counts as a natural sound. So for me, the, kind of the defining characteristic of these natural sounds is that they satisfy certain statistical properties. And then there's some examples of these, um, these properties and the underlying, the observed underlying distributions, which is the orange um, compared to the blue data, as shown here where the, the blue data are from um, a recording of a trumpet playing. And the idea um, with this is that each of these distributions is described by some small number of parameters. And from these parameters, we have kind of a ready-made low dimensional, in fact, very low dimensional, but low dimensional representation of the global to long range properties of a sound. And uh, this uh, characterization is obtained in a way that mimics in some sense, how humans do it. And so obvious questions are uh, whether this is useful and, and whether these parameters contain meaningful information about the sounds. And so we did some initial, initial tests to explore the extent to which these parameters are useful for classification. Uh, here are the results for a musical instrument classification. Uh, and crucially, you see a, an overall success rate of uh, about a third. Um, which on the one hand is clearly not going to change the world. But conversely, I mean, we're only using uh, six of these global parameters uh, in this initial study um, and no time local information. And so with such a, with such a um, low dimensional and indeed non-time dependent uh, representation of a sound, we probably shouldn't expect much more than this. Um, so I, I would argue the reason this result is exciting is because it shows there's clearly something significant and meaningful in these quantities. And building on this, the, uh, the, the full extent to which the parameters can be used to classify sounds uh, more effectively or efficiently uh, is, uh, is the subject of ongoing work. So our next example concerns the use of um, non-homitian metamaterials in the design of 
what I'm going to refer to as enhanced sensors. So the goal here is to be able to sense small local perturbations. So for example, the perturbation that is caused by the introduction of a small particle. This small particle, for example, uh, might be a, a virus. And so you want to detect whether or not this virus is present in your um, in your in the region of your sensing device. Now, typically, such the such an occurrence, for the introduction of a small particle or some other um, small perturbation. Typically, this would cause a shift in the resonant frequencies of this structure that is proportional to the strength of the perturbation, the blue line. The idea here, however, is to design an array for which this shift is enhanced, uh, particularly for, for small perturbations. And the way we're going to achieve this is by adding sources of energy gain and loss to the system and fine tuning the system's parameters accordingly. And devices based on these principles have been designed and implemented. Um, for example, here in a, a photonic setting, uh, they've got three resonators and they've introduced gain on one side and loss on the other. Um, they use heating elements to, in order to, to achieve this. And then on the right, you see the desired enhanced response. Uh, particularly for small perturbations, this response is greatly enhanced from the, uh, the, more, uh, the more standard linear response. So the fundamental result at the heart of, of, our, of our analysis is the following. This is a little bit wordy, but uh, to put it simply, it says that if the systems, as uh, so the system of resonators this is, if the system's Green's function has an nth order singularity, and then you introduce a small particle, what you see is that one of the eigenfrequencies experiences a perturbation, which is, which scales in proportion to uh, the nth root of the size of the particle. So if the particle is very small, this perturbation is going to be very large. This, uh, curve, this constant e to z uh, is one which depends on the, the position of the small particle. So based on this, our aim is to design systems which exhibit these nth order singularities. And a way of, a way of doing this is um, to produce systems that exhibit exceptional points, uh, where an exceptional point is a point in parameter space at which the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of the system simultaneously coincide. So exceptional points are a consequence of, um, of, of the symmetries of system being balanced. And as a result, people commonly search them in structures that already have some symmetry. In particular, parity time symmetry is the, the, the standard assumption. For example, the photonic example I showed you earlier has three symmetric resonators and gain and loss implemented symmetrically on either side. Uh, people also commonly study symmetric Hamiltonians. Um, and then at the bottom here, we have a, an experimental work where they found a way to implement uh, gain and loss into an acoustic system and thereby achieve a, an exceptional point. In our setting, um, the crucial realization is that our previous analysis allowed for complex valued material parameters. Um, so the, this factor in front of the, that appears in the front of the generalized capacitance matrix, there's no reason that it has to be real valued. So we can make it complex valued which we interpret, so the imaginary parts of which we interpret, at least in a slightly abstract way, as representing the addition of gain and loss to the system. And then we can use this generalized capacitance matrix to once again, look for um, coincident eigenvalues and eigenvectors, so exceptional points. And in doing so, the, the crucial realization is that by making these parameters um, have non-zero imaginary part, this, this matrix is then non-Hermitian, uh, so, so can support an exceptional point. 
An important subtlety is that in our setting, we're actually finding asymptotic exceptional points. So these are points at which the generalized capacitance matrix has an exceptional point, which in turn means that the full differential system has an exceptional point at leading order. And so this, is what I'm highlighting is, um, in this case, not a weakness of this analytic approach, but actually represents the behavior of the system we're modeling. Uh, the reason being that this radiation condition, called Sommerfeld's radiation condition, uh, means that the symmetry we impose on the resonators uh, is not extended to the far field. Um, so as a result, we, we won't have exact degeneracy of the exceptional points that we find. However, we can find these asymptotic exceptional points. And indeed, um, for a system of um, two resonators, a symmetric system of two resonators, we find an asymptotic exceptional point of order two and can compute the, um, uh, the parameter values required in order to give that. At the top here, we have uh, a plot of the uh, real and imaginary parts of the, the two subwave and resonant frequencies um, varied as a function of this imaginary part of the, uh, of the material parameters. And indeed, you see in the middle here, and um, there is this asymptotic, somewhere in the middle here is this asymptotic exceptional point. As this gives a good sense of the extent, extent to which this, as, this asymptotic ex exceptional point is indeed asymptotic. Uh, for this plot, this asymptotic parameter delta is on the order of 10 to the minus four. Um, and uh, this, um, I, I claim that this, the error you introduce in this asymptoticness uh, is sufficiently small that we still get the desired enhanced sensing response. So given that this, um, from the, the result that started this section said that the enhanced response that we're looking for has this N exponent, where N is the order of the exceptional point, we want to go further and find higher order subwaving exceptional points uh, and to do that, we needed to study larger systems of resonators. In order to make that um, a little bit easier, uh, we, made a, we made an additional assumption in our work, which is that uh, the resonators are relatively far apart uh, relative to their, their sizes. And the reason this is nice, and this is a, a trick that, that works in, in many settings, um, is that in this case, these capacitance coefficients have explicit leading order asymptotic expansions uh, in terms of this diluteness parameter epsilon. And this is going to be useful because these exp explicit expressions are firstly easier to work with analytically, um, but they also make the numerics much more efficient. And when we want to eventually we'll end up doing for very large systems numerical searches for exceptional points, and this will make this um, uh, much, much more efficient. With this in hand, we can move on to a system of three resonators uh, and show that there exists an asymptotic exceptional point of order three and can compute the, the corresponding parameter values and, and indeed the frequency. Again, looking at the numerics, here's a, a comparison between on the left, the resonant frequencies of the full differential system, which you see in the middle here have this asymptotic exceptional point uh, which can be compared to on the right here, the eigenvalues of the generalized capacitance matrix, which you see has this exact degeneracy uh, in the middle here. And then we can just, just run with this and look at even larger systems. So while a system of three resonators has only one third order sub-wavelength asymptotic exceptional point, a system of four resonators Turns out it has four different parameter values that give rise to such points. Uh, so here I'm showing the distribution of the imaginary parts of the material parameters as uh, so they get the imposed gain and loss uh, on the four resonators at each of the four points. Um, and what's what's nice to observe is that each one has a different underlying symmetry. Um, so the symmetry being captured by the relative uh, position, uh, relative sign and size of the uh, of the, these um, imaginary parts, bearing in mind that we've assumed the system is, 
is PT symmetric. So this is always going to be symmetric in the middle. Um, and then each of these four, each of these four cases is a different combination of relative size and sign of these two values. And then this, this symmetry pattern continues to even larger systems. So here I've taken two of the fourth order asymptotic exceptional points um, and uh, looked for asymptotic exceptional points of higher order in larger systems with the same symmetry. Um, so here we go up to n is 14, so we've got 14th order asymptotic exceptional points. And so the important point here is that um, for, for very large systems, the number of exceptional points grows very quickly. Uh, however, the value of this asymptotic approach is that we can, um, so this, the behavior of this intricate subwave length resonator system has been reduced to just a matrix eigen problem. And thus we can attack it, particularly with the help of this diluteness assumption, uh, we can attack it with all our conventional methods uh, very efficiently um, in order to reveal this interesting and, and otherwise quite difficult to understand behavior. So with that, I will move on to the, the final application I want to explore. And so in what I've presented so far, uh, we've seen uh, methods for designing very precise structures uh, that achieve um, specific and useful effects at very small you know, sub-wavelength scales. However, um, the building these structures, uh, building these small and, and intricate structures is quite difficult. And it's important that the properties of our structures are robust with respect to any errors and imperfections that might be introduced in their design or manufacture. And so I'd like to finish by looking at some of the techniques and ideas um, that are available in this regard. And in particular, I'll use periodic waveguides as the setting to demonstrate this. So fundamentally, there's a, a guiding principle at play here, uh, which is that if you have a periodic structure, and you introduce an error or a perturbation at some point, and then uh, certain frequencies may be localized in a region of that error. There's an example here where my colleagues have perturbed the size of resonator and resonator chain, and you see one of the eigenmodes uh, has this nice exponential decay away from the position of this, um, of this defect. If we look at the spectrum, we look at the band structure corresponding to this crystal, and uh, what we see is that um, in the case of a, a local perturbation like the one made here, so we've just changed the size of this one resonator, then the frequency corresponding to this localized mode, which is shown here in red, is only going to be a very small distance away from uh, the black dots here, which are the um, continuous spectrum of the original unperturbed periodic operator. Indeed, actually, the distance in here is uh, exponentially small as a function of this perturbation. And this is worrisome because as soon as we introduce any uh, errors or imperfections to this structure, this red frequency is liable to get lost in and amongst this continuous spectrum. I mean, that this nice localization behavior is going to break down. And so what we'd like to do is have this localized frequency be much further from the continuous spectrum. And the fundamental principle that is often applied here uh, is that if you take, roughly speaking, if you take two topologically different materials and put them side by side, then the interface between them also supports localized edge modes. And crucially, these edge modes are going to be much more robust with respect to perturbations. Uh, indeed, they're, they're said to be topologically protected. And this um, has been studied uh, at length in, in many settings, from, from quantum mechanics to acoustics and, and photonics. Uh, I've put some, some references here to some examples, but these are um, by no means exhaustive or representative, representative of um, what is a very large and, and very active field. So we're going to explore this by looking at a, a chain of resonators, um, which is going to be kind of a, a, an acoustic realization of, 
uh, what many of you will be familiar with as the SSH model. And to model this, we can um, modify our previous method by swapping the Green's function for the appropriate quasi product Green's function. Uh, we're going to study systems which um, so a 3D differential problem, but with uh, one dimensional periodicity, uh, in which case this um, quasi momentum alpha will vary over. So when I start here, the Bruin zone was going to be a unit circle. And so with this method, so exactly like what we had before for finitely many resonators, for this periodic structure, we have a result that is directly analogous. And this characterizes the subwave and resonant frequencies in terms of the eigenvalues of this quasi-periodic generalized capacitance matrix. In the case of this repeating unit cell, which has two resonators in it, repeating pair of resonators, this, um, this matrix is a two by two matrix. So the point here is we can, we can use essentially the same asymptotic method. With this in hand, uh, we, can, we can do all sorts of things. And one thing we can do is to compute um, topological indices associated to the structure. And so when I said um, a moment ago that we wanted to juxtapose two topologically different structures, what I meant was two structures with different associated topological phases. For instance, uh, we study here the, the ZAC phase, uh, which is really the, the classical example for studying 1D periodic structures, um, defined like so, where U, UJ alpha is the, uh, the jth uh, subwave length eigen mode, which depends on this, this quasi momentum alpha. And we can show that this index takes a value either zero or pi, uh, depending on the relative positions of the resonators, um, particularly depending on the relative sizes of this D and this D prime, these two lengths. So it's worth noting that this is obtained by studying uh, the change in argument of the off diagonal entry of this capacitance matrix. Uh, so again, we're seeing that this, this generalized capacitance matrix characterizes almost everything that we're interested in. And so the end goal of this is to design um, so practical structures with finite dimensions that can perform uh, robust wave localization. So with that in mind, here is an array of 41 resonators, um, which uh, is designed to correspond as sketched here. Um, it has a, a defect in the middle here, and it's designed such that on either side of this defect, you can associate different values of the ZAC phase. What we see is on the left here, there is a quite very strongly localized eigen mode in the region of this defect. But additionally, we see that the localized frequency, which is shown here in red, uh, exhibits very good stability with respect to errors. Um, so here we're adding on the x-axis increasingly large, um, increasingly large uh, random normally distributed errors in the positions of the resonators. And what you see is that the, um, the uh, localized frequency is much more stable uh, than, than the, the ones in the continuous spectrum. Its variance is a whole order of magnitude less. On top of this, you see that um, this localized frequency also stays nicely localized in the middle of the band gap. And so this idea of wanting to put uh, frequencies in the middle of the band gap is something we can pursue further. Um, and indeed, we can really establish this as a workflow for trying to create uh, robust localized modes which have tunable properties. So, for example, one thing you could do is start with a, a periodic structure that has a subwave with band gap and introduce a dislocation. And what we see is that when we do this, this causes um, resonant frequency to enter the band gap from either side. And indeed, as this dislocation becomes arbitrarily large, these two mid-gap frequencies converge to some single value in the middle of the band gap. 
The consequence of this is that if we we found a way to put a dislocated, oh, sorry, put a localized frequency at any desired position within the band gap. And so we can study this both numerically, but also uh, we can prove analytic statements about this dislocated system. So we suppose first that the um, dislocation length is equal to some multiple of the periodicity. So let's say one unit cell. In which case the uh, dislocated resonators line up with um, the next pair along. And thus this dislocated structure is the same as if you just removed this pair in the middle. And so the idea of this fictitious sourced method is to replace these two that are missing, um, but replace them with the addition of these source terms F and G, which are imposed on the boundary of the resonators. Um, and then the crucial step here is to show that it's possible to choose these, um, choose these fictitious sources, this F and G, such that uh, the spectrum of this new problem is the same as the dislocated array that we started with. The advantage of this is that this um, new problem, the one with the fictitious sources, once again has a periodic geometry, uh, and thus we can use Floquet theory to study its solutions in a, in a concise and efficient way. And so with this, we can go along and for each, um, each integer multiple of the dislocation length equal to each integer multiple of the periodicity, go along and, and analyze what happens to the structure. Then all that remains in order to really understand what happens with these, these two curves is to, to fill in the gaps. And we can do that by you know, firstly studying the case of asymptotically small dislocation length. Um, we can also study what happens as the dislocation becomes arbitrarily large. Um, and we can also come up with an argument to show that uh, in the gaps between any of these two crosses, no frequency can leave the band gap. So that has to, that has to remain two curves. And then this leads us to um, a theorem that looks like the following, which says, I mean, the corollary is, is maybe the, the, the nicest statement, if anything, um, which says that for any value omega, at least in the middle of the band gap, um, we can find a dislocation like D such that there is a structure with that dislocation length, which has that frequency as a subwave interesting frequency. The subtlety here uh, is this, this parameter DNOR, um, which is that uh, arises from the fact that our, um, our fictitious sources method uh, doesn't, doesn't work in the case that the dislocation is sufficiently small that the resonators still overlap. So this just means that there's some small region at the edge of the band gap, uh, which our, our method is not able to describe. And these results are analogous to some which were shown previously for Schrodinger operators, where they had dislocated periodic potentials. And this was the, the source of inspiration for this work. Um, a, a crucial difference, however, is that uh, when you're dislocating a periodic potential, when you dislocate by one multiple of the periodicity length, you recover the initial configuration. And then you can, uh, th these, um, these authors, things like defining defining indices edge indices as the number of the number of states that cross the band gap in this period of dislocation um, and then you can prove bulk edge and bulk edge correspondences and so on in our case however with a, a system of resonators the physics is different because when you dislocate you don't recover the starting configuration again um, and so we really had to deal with uh, all positive dislocation lengths uh, including understanding the behavior for arbitrarily large dislocation. And then this is uh, my final slide. So we have, um, again, we want to look at, we've studied this periodic system. We want to look at the finite equivalent. Um, and here is a very, very simple example. We have, uh, well, let's look at the, the case of just six resonators with dislocation length D. On the top left here, we see 
uh, the expected pairwise convergence of the frequencies as, as this dislocation D increases. Uh, on the bottom left, we see the plot like we've had before. On the x-axis, we've got increasing, um, increasing variance of random perturbations. And again, you see the, the middle frequencies tend appear to be somewhat more stable than the, the others. And on the right is perhaps the most interest, interesting plot of the three, which here we're adding uh, random errors to the positions again, uh, but varying the dislocation length. And the thing that I want to particularly draw your attention to is that there appears to be somewhere in the middle here, some position of um, optimal stability, should we say. So in here, in here, the resonant frequencies really aren't very, very much, at least not compared to some of the others, which are, are very, very significantly. And so this apparent position of, of optimal stability um, firstly corresponds to when this frequency is pretty much in the middle of the band gap of the uh, original starting structure, uh, which um, I hypothesize is not a coincidence. And this really demonstrates the value of this result um, because it, it has uh, given us a way to fine tune and even try to optimize the properties of these subwavelength wave curves. And that brings me to the end. Um, so to, to summarize, I'd like to reiterate the fact that these, these three different applications of, of high contrast metamaterials that I've discussed um, have all, so the, the analyses have all been based on this same asymptotic method, uh, which is this characterization of subwavelength resonance in terms of the eigenstates of this generalized capacitance matrix. And I hope this has at least partially convinced you this is a, a versatile and, and insightful approach. Um, so with that, I'll finish. Thank you again to the organizers, uh, and thank you to you all for, for listening this afternoon.